Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Upheaval by Asher's favorite author, uh, Jared Diamond, How Nations Cope with Crises and Change. Our third Jared Diamond, uh, after what collapse, guns, germ, steel, and upheaval. So this book, as the name suggests, is all about nations and countries when they suffer crises and how they actually cope and get through the other side and potentially be better for it. Yeah, there's crises and pressures at every level. Individuals go through it, uh, teams go through it, businesses go through it, and then, of course, nations and even the whole world has crises. And these crises are may arise from external pressures, say someone being deserted or widowed by their spouse or a nation getting threatened by or attacked by another opposing nation. Yeah, of course. So shit's going to hit the fan whether you're a person going through your day-to-day life. Some bad things are going to come. You're probably going to experience a few times in your life where things just all seem like they're just falling apart. Same goes uh, with nations and countries. There's there's plenty out there that have gone through huge changes. Like in the book, uh, he explores nine different countries and um, we're going to go through three of them in this episode. Successful coping with change, whether that's from external pressures or internal pressures, comes from selective change and that's true for nations and individuals and the key is selective. There's going to be some kind of change but you can't just change everything. You can't completely abandon everything and start from scratch. You need to just change some things and be super selective about what you do and what you don't change. Almost everyone has or will experience an upheaval caused by personal crisis. Of course, when you're in the middle of it, you don't pause to think about the academic definitions of what defines a crisis or not, or you don't think of what are the exact steps that I need to follow to selectively change my life. But probably when you're in it, you're feeling like crap. And then on the other side, you might look back and say, oh, that was a crisis that I had an upheaval and selective change from. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you might have this single unanticipated shock. It might be a death of a loved one or being fired without warning from your job or a serious accident or a natural disaster, anything like that. It might just go bang. Other ones come in the form where they just build slowly like the old frog in boiling water, such as your disintegration of your marriage, just day by day, it slowly just builds up till the big bang or chronic serious illness in yourself or in someone who you love. Well, there's also like developmental ones that come at a specific point in life, whether that's going through adolescence or having a a midlife crisis or hitting retirement age. They're, They're like developmental crises based on a specific period throughout your life. When you go and see the therapist, when you're going through these shock and upheaval sort of moments, uh, crisis therapists have identified at least a dozen different factors that make it more or less likely that you're going to succeed in going through whatever ordeal you might be going through. So these are the elements of a personal crisis. So you'll be able to recognize how these things could, if you went through some of these steps, they could help you get through your personal crisis. And then what we're going to do with the book is look at, okay, well, that's how things apply in the the individual realm. How can we take these concepts and extrapolate them to how a nation would go through crisis and how they can use some of these steps to cope with their own selective change? That's it. So there's 12 of them. And this is what Diamond's doing is borrowing in from the personal therapist, crisis therapist, uh, realm and applying it to countries. The first one, of course, is acknowledgement that one is in a crisis. This is probably the one that le- makes you go to therapy if things are going to shit. Uh, like if you don't at least acknowledge that and you're just in la-la land, you're probably not going to see the therapist in the first place. Yeah, if you're just going through whatever you're going through, you might be uh, either passively or actively denying what's going through. It isn't until the point where you actually say, okay, I've got a problem, I'm in a crisis, Once you accept and acknowledge that, that's when you can start to move forward. The second factor which is going to help you resolve the crises, of course, is acceptance of personal responsibility. It's not enough to just say, hey, I've got a problem because a lot of people go, I've got a problem, but it's someone else's fault. Uh, You got to say, hey, I've got a problem and this is my responsibility in how these problems come about. That's right. So that happens obviously on the individual level, but also on the national level. Another one is building a fence. So you got to, once you've sort of acknowledged that there's a problem, and once you've accepted personal responsibility, then you've got to build a fence to delineate between sort of you and the problem. So what comes with this when you're building this fence is asking the question, hey, what should I discard from my personality, the way I've been doing things and discard it, but also replace it with a new way of doing things. So this selective change is really key for whole nations when they're going through crises, when they're looking to develop new ways in policy and culture. Another one is help from others. If you're an individual, you might have a 
uh, a partner, a friend, a family member or a colleague or some kind of support group, these people can come along and help you through your crisis. Or if you're a nation, you might receive help from other nations, whether that's financial help, military support or some kind of other help from another country. Another aspect is the experience of previous crises. If you've been through the, the same thing in the past, you can obviously learn from your previous experience and apply it to whatever current crises that you might be going through and that is going to help you along. Same with countries. Your historical experience, if you've, you've had the difficult things in the past, then you're going to be better uh, off in the present and in the future. Yeah, that's right. For a nation, say you might go look back throughout your own history, you're going through a, through a, an economic recession and you look back, oh, actually 40 years ago, we went through the same thing and we came out all right. Or you might look throughout history and see that another nation had done this sort of, had gone through this similar crisis before and they turned out all right as well. Another one is uh, a bit of a dichotomy. On one hand, it's your core values. I mean, what are the things that make you as a person who you are and these are non-negotiable beliefs that you're not going to compromise on in your life. But also, what are you flexible with, right? Like, what values can you change? Because as the context in the world does change, you probably need to change in some ways depending on where you find yourself in. Same thing when it comes to countries. Uh, certain ideologies might have made a lot more sense 30 or 40 years ago when the world was in a different place. But today, the world has changed. So maybe what are the things that you can be flexible with in terms of your values to make way for for this crisis? As Jim Collins might say, preserve the core and stimulate progress. Hey, it comes up again. It comes up all the time. (laughs) Uh, Another one I reckon is patience. If you're going through something, if you're in the middle of a crisis, obviously you want to be over right now or over tomorrow at the very latest. But sometimes crises don't resolve themselves that quickly and you sometimes need a bit of patience just to trudge through the through the mud, especially when you take that out to the national level. It's going to be often slow moving, often a lot of change, probably a lot of red tape and bureaucracy involved. So it's not going to happen overnight. You need a bit of patience in order to cope with these this selective change. So this framework can be applied to any country in, in the world whether it be right now trying to apply it to cope with whatever change and crises you're going through, but also retrospectively find out how they actually dealt with it in the past. And that's what we're going to do for this rest of this episode. We're going to look at three countries and in the historical context and try and learn from it so we can make better decisions today. So firstly, Finland, um, particularly through the Second World War, then Chile through the period of political instability with Pinochet and Allende, And finally, we're coming home with Australia, our past and how we're changing and how we're really coping with our identity change, particularly as our demographics are changing. First country we're looking at is Finland, which is a really interesting country. It uh, borders Sweden to the west and Russia to the east as we know it today. And its security rests on a bit of a glaring paradox throughout its interesting history. On one hand, it's a liberal social democracy that for many decades has had a excellent relationship with the Soviet Union and today with Russia. So obviously holding those two is a paradox being a social democracy as well as having that relationship with communist Russia. This complexity in its history features a remarkable example of its selective change, which is what we're about to find out. As a geography, Finland is a a small country bordered between Russia and Scandinavia, really is a bit of a buffer zone between the two sandwiched right in the middle. And historically, Finland was pretty hotly contested between Sweden and Russia. Russia, in 1809, really held the land that we know as as Finland and held it for most of the century. Russia kind of let Finland run with autonomy and its own parliament, its own administration, its own currency. But then there was this civil war that happened in the early 1900s where Finland wanted to claim independence. So on one hand, you had the conservative whites who were trained in Germany and they went to war within obviously the one country being a civil war with the Reds, so the other part within the country who were communists who were all about Russia's side. So it was the actually the conservative side who got ahead this time and they kicked at the ass of the communists. They, they shot about 8,000 Reds and they starved about 20,000 in con- concentration camps. But as you'd imagine after that, you got the big mother Russia or the Soviet Union to the side of you, and you'd be pretty scared after committing those sort of acts to our fellow communists. Yeah, that's right. They they kind of they'd won the battle. They'd claimed their independence, but really for the next two or three decades, they were pretty fearful of uh, some kind of retaliation or Russia coming back to try to get them again because the ideologies of the two countries were so opposed. It was in a bit of a precarious position for a few decades here. 
On one hand, you got Finland as a liberal capitalist democracy, and of course, Soviet Union as a repressive communist dictatorship. So Finland, naturally, in the 1930s, um, they started to strengthen its army and its defences in anticipation of what might be coming around the corner. And things started becoming pretty tense in the 1930s because obviously there was a rise of Hitler um, and Germany at the time. And you've also got Stalin as well. So Finland, this little country, has got these big powerhouses strengthening up all around them. Finland kind of wanted to be a bit neutral between the two. They didn't want to get in the middle. But then they were stunned as the rest of the world war to hear that Hitler and Stalin had abruptly called for this non-aggression pact. And what they kind of found out, though, was that as part of this deal, as part of this secret agreement between uh, Hitler and Stalin, they actually said, hey, Finland, you know, I reckon we could take it. Let's let's just take over Finland. We'll divvy it up. Um, Hitler, you take a little slice. Stalin, you take a slice, and we can both share in Finland. Now, a lot of countries in this situation will be like, hey, go ahead. Um, you, know, you're like <laughs> you guys year- are massive. <laughs> Do well, what like you want little, this. It's like you're, you're literally like the little year seven. You're 13 years old and then the year 12 bullies come over. Um, you got two of them, two <laughs> biggest bullies at the school and they're telling you, all right, we're going to, you, you know, that lunch, that hot dog yeah. you're holding there, I'm going to have a half and my other mate here is having half. <laughs> yeah. Or they might shake you down. They say, okay, you take the wallet, I'll take the phone. And you just think, okay, I don't want any trouble, guys. Here you go. You just hand yourself over. Well, Finland in this case, they said, no, nah, we're not going to have any of it which blew Stalin away because he couldn't imagine a country so tiny was crazy to fight a population that was 50 times larger. So Stalin said, all right, if that's how you want to play <laughs> little kid with your hot dog there and your iPhone in your pocket, look, we're going to war now, mate. So in November 30, 1939, the Soviet Union had attacked Finland. So the Soviet Union they had a population of 170 million versus Finland with their puny 3 million at the time. The Soviets thought, oh, we can take these guys. They're, they've got 120,000 blokes in their army. We'll just send a little portion of ours. We'll just send half a mil over, which is still 4X. Uh, and they thought, okay, we should do this pretty easy. They also said, okay, well, we're the Soviets. We've got tanks. We've got modern warplanes. We've got modern artillery. Finland, they kind of had nothing. They had, some, they had some good rifles, some good machine guns, but they actually didn't really have much ammunition. So the, the, the commanders said to the soldiers, hey, we don't have many bullets here, so just hold fire until they're really close. Don't, don't just shoot willy-nilly. We've got to kind of preserve what we got here and just, just wait till you've really got a good shot before you take a shot. Absolutely. Just continuing our metaphor, our year 12 student here has got a big club and an axe and our little year seven here has got a little stick and there's a huge mismatch here, but the Finns, they weren't insane. They knew they couldn't beat the Soviets. Instead, they must have read Robert Greene's 33 mm. Strategies of War, which wasn't out of the, at the time because they made the aim to not defeat Russia, but to make their victory as slow and painful and costly as possible. And specifically to resist long enough that they could get help from elsewhere and uh, some of the other allies would come in and protect Finland. It was to the great surprise of the whole world that their defences actually held strong. They've got this massive army that they're up against, but they managed to hold tight. They managed to keep that line and keep their defences strong. They actually invented the Molotov cocktail where they had the bottles filled with gasoline and other chemicals and they lit, a, lit the rag on top on fire and launched it at the, at the tanks. They also tried to do some other innovative techniques. They jammed logs into the tracks of the tanks. A few daredevils, they called themselves the anti-tank crew, they'd run up and they'd poke their gun either down the cannon barrel itself or maybe through the observation slits to try to shoot the soldiers inside the inside the tank. They did all right, but the casual rate of those people was 70%. So they might have picked up a few on the way, but not many of them survived. That's insane courage when you think about it. And this is one of the big reasons. <laughs> Imagine running Beyond up to insane, a tank. isn't it? You got, you got a gun and they've got a tank and you're just running straight up to them and try to poke your gun down the barrel. And Jesus. Them, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's like I, I can't even <laughs> think of... Relaying back to our old year seven mate metaphor, yeah. that's just even beyond anything <laughs> yeah. like that. But this is one of the big re- one of the big reasons they were able to be so courageous and crazy in the face of such challenges and such crises. They were so motivated to be not taken over by the ideologies of what was coming from communist Russia. So they were fighting for their families, their country, their independence, and the whole entire country was willing to die for these goals. Another reason they did so well in the battle was that they were accustomed to living and skiing in the Finnish forests in winter. They were familiar with the terrain. They had the right kind of equipment. They had the boots, the tents, and they had the things that were actually suited to the conditions, whereas the Soviets were a little bit more unfamiliar with what they were about to hit. 
So in the end, the Finnish army, they were far more effective in proportion to its numbers and they achieved their goal of just making it as costly as possible for the Soviet Union because they were a bit worried about um, Germany and other countries around and they couldn't invest their whole entire army trying to occupy little Finland. So in the end, the Soviets had to retaliate and in many ways, Finland, they had won this war despite losing such a huge proportion of its population. So things were pretty comfortable for a little while. They'd had their peace deal. The Soviets had backed off. And for a couple of years there, things were looking all right for Finland. But as we know, throughout the Second World War, Germany was building and building. They'd occupied Norway. They'd occupied Denmark. Then they defeated France. So the Finns knew that they were kind of cut out now. They were literally on all, all sides. They've got, they've got the Soviet Union on one side, and now Germany has taken over everything else around them. So they kind of can't really, they didn't really have any hope of, say, the British or the French coming to help them out in the next battle. They were really stuck between a rock and a hard place, and they kind of had the cruel reality to choose a side. They had to either pick the Germans coming from one side or the Russians or the, or the Soviets coming from the other side. Yeah, indecision here. You just end up either or both of them taking over the country again. So, uh, yeah, you normally wouldn't want to side with a bloke like Hitler, but in the context of survival, nothing's really off the table. So Finland, they had the awful realisation that they were again going to war with the Soviet Union. They had to mobilise a, a huge chunk of their population, one-sixth of it, so men, women, children, so many people. And in 1944, they were back at it with the Soviet Union. But learning from the similar war three years earlier, they again tried to make it as costly as possible for the Soviets, who obviously were at war with Germany as well. And because they did that, they ended up being the sole European country who through their fighting, they avoided enemy occupation in World War II. I mean, no other country was really able to do that. So again, they had to sign a Russian peace treaty to say, hey, come on, come on, big Soviet Union, come on, Germany, let's wrap all this war stuff up where this is getting too costly for both of us. So as part of this peace deal uh, of being at war with Russia, they said, okay, let's sign this agreement, we'll stop fighting. And Finland said, even though we're a small country and you guys are massive, we're going to fork over $300 billion to the to the Soviet Union within the next six years. That's a massive... Is that right? Is that a, a massive, massive whack? One? Or is that... Have you done a typo? Is that, that's a lot of money, $300 billion in six years in 1940s. Might have been today's dollars or it might be a typo. One of that. But Either way, it's, it's, a, a, it's a lot of it's cash. It's a lot of money. <laughs> well, par- paradoxically though... Being so strapped for cash, bootstrapping like an old startup, they were a pretty undeveloped economy at the time, but this pressure forced them to really develop heavy industries such as building ships and factories for ex- export, and they had to industrialize their whole entire nation to actually get through this period. In addition to the sort of financial part of the deal, they also sort of had the ideological or political part of the deal where they wanted to try to appease, obviously, the Soviet Union's massive. They didn't want them coming in and taking over, so they tried to sort of you know, reduce their threat level by saying, "Hey, okay, we'll clear some of these uh, some of these Germans out. We'll legalize the Finnish Communist Party. Uh, we'll give them a couple of seats in the government." So they're kind of doing things to show that, "Hey, we're we're not really against you guys anymore. We're kind of part of part of your team now." Yeah, they even put on trial their superstar war heroes who were fighting on Germany's side just about five or six years earlier, and now just to appease Russia, they're saying. All right, you know those people we um, who were our superstars five years ago? We'll get rid of them as well. We're going to put them on trial for, for war crimes, just like all the Nazis. So this finely tuned, finely balanced tightrope act that they were playing here to both maintain their independence but also appease the Soviet Union and also having a little bit of economic growth, turned out this very small country uh, started to really develop themselves as a nation. And by world standards today, Finland is actually fighting up there among, even though it's only 6 million people, they're really competing uh, with some of the biggest countries in the world. So they've really faced the harsh reality and the big one is just how small their population is against the, the big bullies on either side or historically bullies and how to make sure the bullies aren't going to smack them up. So they've done a few things to solve these problems, like we, like we mentioned, developing industrializing their whole economy. Another one is making productive use of its entire population. With such a small population, you want everybody who grows up to become an adult to contribute something. And their school system through this has ended up being perhaps the best in the world, particularly compared to, say, the US school system, which educates some people well and some people poorly, depending on, I'd say, your starting point. Yeah, Diamond says that the US, is there's a fair uh, diaspora between the haves and Jeez, the haves what's not. that word? I don't know. I don't even know if it works. Die being too 
I don't even know. Diaspora. Go, diaspora. I like it. Keep, we'll go keep going. It. Yeah. A diaspora between the haves and the haves nots. I think I got that from Survivor Fiji actually in season 14. Um, between the haves and the haves nots. Uh, but he was saying that Finland, they just, everyone gets a good job and there's, er, sorry, everyone gets a good education. It's not really that you've got the, the fancy, expensive private schools where only the rich and the elites can go to. It says that the private schools, there's a couple around, but they're not really that much better than the public schools. They can't demand massive sums. And also, whilst in most of the world, you've got school teachers who are complaining about inadequate salaries and only moderate social status. In Finland, school teachers are kind of the, the top of the top. It's very competitive to get into. There's a harsh selection process where they want the best teachers. They reward them financially. Also, socially, they reward them as well. It'd be almost like the, the, the best and the brightest go on to become school teachers. Which is a huge difference. If the highest status jobs are school teachers, your A graders, all through university, you're going to all go in that direction. And that's probably the most productive job um, to actually develop your country. And because of that, the Finnish students, they score near the top of the world in the national rankings of literacy, math, and problem-solving abilities. Similarly, Finland, they get the best out of their police force. Everybody, to join the police force, you need a college degree, which is not the same around the rest of the world. They're also trusted by 96% of the country, which is definitely not the same as the rest of the world. And interestingly, they pretty much never use their guns. He said in one year, there was six shots fired by the police in a whole year, uh, and five of those were warning shots. And Diamond, who was living in LA, he said that's like pretty much every hour he's, the weekend. he's having that. This yeah. is a, a normal Saturday afternoon for him. So they've gone through these wild, wild challenges, Finland growing up, they had all sorts of external pressures pushing on them. And if you look at them today, they're really a country we can all look at and try and emulate. They're a world leader in tech, education, and a country that invests more than any other really when it comes to um, public research and development in, in developing their economies even further and making the gap between all of us other stragglers behind them even bigger. If we zoom out now to have a look at uh, from what we said in the introduction with some of the aspects that make it more likely that you'll overcome a crisis uh, and come out stronger on the other side, whether as an individual or as a nation, we can see some of the, the aspects here that Finland really embraced. One of those big ones was that acknowledgement that they're in a, in a crisis, was that accepting responsibility and saying, okay, we're not just going to wait for someone to come and save us. We're going we're gonna to get out there and start getting to work and we're going to take on this personal responsibility and this national responsibility. There was a huge self-appraisal in here and just being self-awareness of who, who they really are. Can you imagine how painful it was that after all the Soviet Union had killed your, your brother, your sister, all these families, your, so many orphans, widows, um, because remember, they, they lost the hugest or the largest percentage of their population out of ever, anyone else in the war. So you'd think in most countries, would say, hey, no way we're going to side with the Soviet Union. They're such assholes, but they realized how small they were as a country and they realized they got to massage the shoulder of the, uh, the year 12. <laughs> That's right. And they also realized that when, uh, you know, towards the end of the Second World War, they realized, okay, no one's coming to save us. We're going to have to do something here. We're going, we, we can't just maintain our neutrality. We're going to have to pick one side or the other. Some people might look at that and think, oh, you guys, you guys copped out. You should have kept fighting. But the, the Finland realized, they, look, they had to pick a side in order to keep moving forward. The second aspect that they did really well was this selective change choosing the things to keep and choosing the things to compromise on and of course this is maintaining the liberal democracy but probably not in the same ways as other liberal democracies like to run themselves around the world they had to change in certain ways or compromise on aspects of a liberal democracy to be somewhat of a communist nation and cancel certain books they had to postpone elections and they had to censor certain things and violate a normal democracy's rights including the freedom of action. And as a result, um, after 70 years since World War II, they're no closer to being part of the Soviet Union or becoming a Russian satellite than they were back then. But ultimately, whilst they were selective in changing some of these things, making a couple of compromises, they really held strong onto their core values. It really became a non-negotiable for them to maintain their independence. They never wanted to be occupied by another power. They were always willing to fight for it and they were obviously in many cases, they were willing to risk death in order to maintain their independence. So Jonesy's good mate, Jared Diamond, went to Chile in 1967 and he was wandering around. Everything seemed nice and peaceful. Chile that had a long history 
of democratic government. They didn't frequently have any you know, military government sort of takeovers like Peru and Argentina had in, in Latin America. And really, they sort of saw themselves more as a, a European or country or similar to US and less like the other Latin American countries around them geographically. That was in 67. It was only six years later in 1973, things were very different. They'd been taken over by a military dictatorship that smashed the previous world records from governments. That's a mantle you want to hold, I'm not too sure, for perpetuating <laughs> sadistic torture. So it so went wild. It's a, I suppose it's a, on one hand it's a world record, but yeah, do you really want that world record? No. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have thought so. So after you're going to hear about the Chilean history in, in this episode, you're going to have a few questions that might pop up. I mean, like they thought they were in this democratic um, society, which was so peaceful and so easy, and then things turned to shit so quickly. Can the same sort of thing happen mm. to our countries? Yeah, most Westerners would see themselves as the 1967 version of Chile where it was nice and peaceful and calm and democratic and they could never have this kind of military overthrowing and this uh, decades-long dictatorship. But all of a sudden, it just seemed to happen to them. So could it all of a sudden just happen to us as well? Okay, let's just zoom back to the mid-20th century. So Chile, like a lot of countries, they had a few parties. They had three of them. Um, consisting of a left party, a centre party, and a right party. They're all pretty similar in strength. Within that party, you got different factions. Of course, you got some who are moderates and some who are on the extreme side of things who want you know radical revolution sort of changes. In 1964, the moderates held the power. The leader was regarded as well-intentioned, as honest, and the fear from the the sort of ex- left leftist extremists led the right wingers to really support this moderate position. But as a moderate was in power, we still had the factions on either the the extremes on either side of the political end. So um, the extreme left wing were thinking, all right, this guy's not uh, progressive enough and, and compassionate enough. And the extreme right wings thought this guy is too much of a left wing wokey. Don't know what the word back then was, but in any case, this led to everyone feeling frustrated with Chilean politics in 1969. Yeah, there were chronic meat shortages, there were strikes, there were inflations, uh, there was street violence. And so really, they got to a point where everything was nice and calm. They got to a point where actually all three, the left, the middle and the right, they were all equally frustrated and unhappy and they all wanted a bit of change. So in 1970, things started to get a little bit more extreme. Firstly, we had a new president that, who was appointed into power, and his name was Salvador Allende. He ran for he was a career politician. He'd ran for president in 52, 58, 64. Bit of a loser. <laughs> he lost three in a row. Never got any thought, all right, game time. I'm finally in. Finally snuck this in is, there. He uh, snuck in there, and, and he thought, all right, it's Allende's time to shine. That's right. Fourth bite of the cherry. He finally got in there. But the thing was, he only got in there with 36% of the voters. So when you got three, you know, three, 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 thirty-three percent each, really, it's only a very small margin that he got in there by 36%. And of course, if there's 36% that have voted for you, that means 64% are against you. Yeah. So despite having this power, 60, even if 60, most of the population are getting pissed off by what you're doing... You're still the top dog, so you can make the calls yourself. That's exactly what he did. He made some calls which pissed a lot of people off. Firstly, he nationalized a lot of the copper companies without paying compensation and said, all right, you're going to be part of the government. He ramped up the costs and the spending from the government. And thirdly, he froze the prices of all the items in the Chile's economy just so, you know, obviously so the poorer people can get access to purchase these goods. The result of some of these changes was widespread economic chaos, which of course led to violence and led to even stronger opposition against him. The government deficits, the printing of money, these all caused inflation, foreign investment started to dry up, foreign aid started to dry up, consumer goods started to become scarce, Uh, there was empty shelves, there was long queues. So really, whilst he had good intentions, his execution was pretty horrendous and really there was a lot of trouble brewing. Absolutely. In that country, those 64% of people... Well, a good chunk of the people, they thought, all right, enough's enough. We can't have this happen to our country. And seemingly inevitable it happened. In 1973, a coup happened. Coup? Coup? Coup. 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 And it was a military one from the Chilean forces. All three got involved, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. 
mate, this sounds just absolutely bizarre. <laughs> Dom saying this happened six years before. I'm hoping this doesn't happen to us in six <laughs> years. Can, but, yeah. but you never know because um, the Chilean Air Force bombed the president's palace in Santiago whilst the Chilean army's tanks shelled it. So <laughs> it's a pretty coordinated orchestra there, isn't it? Getting the tanks to... Five shells <laughs> as the you're sitting there as a yander going all right this is uh this hasn't gone gone well and well, I like how you said that the navy were in on this as well it doesn't sound like they did much but uh, at least they were <laughs> philosophically <laughs> they, they were, were on cheering board, on guess, from yeah. the uh, they were cheering on from the ocean I guess yeah that's right um, big old Allende he thought okay well I'm pretty cooked here so he ended up he ended up taking his own life uh, and they thought okay well. I guess we win now. We're in charge. The military's in charge. And they just thought, okay, we'll throw a bloke in there uh, as our short-term leader. And it, it seemed that the, the the man to take charge was General Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet, yeah. So he was like, he's like yippee, I'm, I'm in power now. Yep. Um, and I thought, all right, yeah, that's fine. In th- you know, three years, we'll democratically elect someone else. Yeah. And then I we'll thought, just- oh, yeah, just have a little crack at it. And then we'll just, you know, we'll sort of mix it up a bit and we'll work out what the long-term plan is. You just fill the, fill the gap for now. Finish. He probably played along early days. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. But when the time came to to knock on the door, they said, "Hey, Pinochet, uh, you know that that deal we made? Like, we're just democratic government." Yeah. He thought, oh, "Look, I've got the I've got the army on my back. I've got the <laughs> navy over here. I've got the no. Nah, I, I think I'll stay." Oh my goodness! <laughs> That's exactly what he did. That's what he did. He he hung around, and what he started doing was he started actually rounding up. All the lefties that tried to take over and said, okay, well, I'm in charge now. So what he did was within 10 days, he took all these leftists who were supporting the previous government, took them to the sports stadium, interrogated them all, tortured them all, and then killed them all. And then after he'd done sort of this initial burst, five weeks later, they had what they now call the caravan of death, where they just started roaming around and just slitting throats, I guess. They did, and that's exactly what they did. So the goal was to exterminate the entire left wing. No one could have anticipated Pinochet that it was going to be this brutal, nor like could they anticipate that he said he was going to stay in power for so long and continue his military dictatorship. Yeah, they thought, oh, we'll throw him. He's a pretty safe bet. We'll just throw him in for this short-term little, little, little gap filler. But it turns out that within a couple of years, the Pinochet government, they'd arrested 130,000 Chileans, 1% of the population. And uh, some of them were released, but a lot of them just disappeared. They say here in quote unquote disappeared. So he was having fun, uh, albeit as a sick man, <laughs> Pinochet. Sick man. He wasn't moving anywhere. Kept on going, kept on going. 1980, kept on going. Um, he entrenched this right wing and military interest. And then he was made it. So he was voted in again for another eight years up until 1989. 1989 came on and he coerced again the elections to make sure that he was elected again for another eight years. All of a sudden it's 1997 and... <sighs> That peaceful timing we were talking about earlier, 1960s, long bloody oh time of just having Allende and especially Pinochet in charge for such a long time. Yeah, pretty crazy that Pinochet's short-term stint of a couple of months has now turned into, what, two and a half decades here. Uh, the US government actually supported Pinochet for the first half of his reign because he was very anti-communist. Uh, I don't know if they supported the idea of rounding people up and slitting throats, but they definitely supported the the political ideologies. And it wasn't until a bit later where they started to think, okay, well, maybe you've got taken it a bit too far now, mate. You better sort of pull your head in a bit. But that's, you know, 24 years where he's been in power. So in 1997, Pinochet's reign was finally over. And the whole country, as you'd imagine, they thought, wow, what the hell just happened for the last few decades? Let's just not go back to that. <laughs> yeah. We need to change this. And a left-wing government came into power, but they thought, all right, we're not extreme. We're, we're not extremely left-wing. We're actually just here to build a Chile for all Chileans because that's what everyone wanted at that stage. They thought that political polarization, it's too bullshit. Uh, mm. We need to come together and be one for a change. So since that time where they'd made that change, they have had multiple presidents uh, from both sides. They've really sort of mixed it up and it does, you know, it seems... Almost, I guess, back to what they used to be, a Chile for all Chileans where they had a little bit of a mix. The pendulum swings from left to right, as does in most places. Um, and so while they're sort of still feeling the, the effects of that long-term change, they've sort of come back to now a place where it seems to be uh, a place of tolerance, a bit of compromise, sharing between alternate powers, I guess, back to what they used to be. So the cross is the chi- when I when I say Chile, I just think back when I meet Chileans and they just shake their head because oh, I just pronounce it Chile. More Chile. More Chile. <laughs> That's a poker game, <laughs> poker's game. But their, theirs was very different to 
uh, a few other crises. Like we're going to talk about Australia in a second, which was about peaceful revolution. They went through a violent revolution. And unlike Finland's crisis, which was about an external one from external powers pushing onto them, their crisis was an internal one. It came from internally this political polarization and disagreements between the left and the right parties. And for a period of time, they forgot what their core values were and they were willing to kill and to risk being killed rather than compromise with each other. Through this crisis, they went through a lot of uncertainty, a lot of failure. There's a couple of rounds of failed elections uh, where they were trying to change. Needed a bit of that patience to get through it all. But in the end, what they found was the big papa, selective change. They initially had that uh, long-standing tradition of minimal military intervention, which obviously went against, but then eventually returned to. And they also had that uh, long-standing tension between the government economic intervention and government hands-off economic approach, where they found that middle ground and found that selective change. Finally, the big one I think with Chile is that uh, could be emblematic, I hope bloody, bloody well hope not, <laughs> of what today is. We consider us... A lot of the countries around the world consider themselves liberal democracies that aren't going to change. But at the same time, we do have, you could say, we have that same frustration that they had at the time of um, people who are progressive and left-wing not getting exactly what they want. You could say the same thing about the right-wing, just being feeling frustrated. I think the whole world is so frustrated with politics right now. And because of that, this political polarization is ramping up and same with the tensions. So bloody hell, could the same sort of thing happen to us today? Uh, let's hope not. Let's hope we can learn from history and books like this one to avoid the same fate. When Jared Diamond visited Australia in 1964, he wrote that Australia seemed more British than Britain. Australian people were not just overwhelmingly white everywhere. All the food was British as well. You got your Sunday roast, uh, your Yorkshire pudding, which my grandma cooks a mean one. You got the fish and ship shops. You got your Vegemite. You got your British style pubs that you sit around and just knock beers out uh, the day. So that's pretty much just Britain, just an outpost within Australia. Then uh, his son, That's a there's a big gap in age here, I reckon. He must have been getting on it late in life. But apparently 44 years later, he came, his son was doing uh, a university exchange in Brisbane. Uh, and when Jared popped over to visit in uh, the mid, in the early 2000s, he realized a big change. He saw that uh, obviously Australia's geographic proximity to Asia had started to make a bit more sense now because he, he was seeing Asian people everywhere. He'd seen not just the British pubs, but he'd see a bit of a Japanese restaurant, a Thai restaurant, a Vietnamese restaurant, Chinese restaurants. So what Australia used to have was a white Australia policy when he came the first time. By the second time, that white Australia policy had disappeared and all sorts of different people from different backgrounds had started coming to Australia. As we're going to race through all of Australian history, we're going to see that the crises that we went through um, didn't erupt just in one day. Instead, it was the unfolding of a response to the years of what happened following World War II. So the basic question we're going to explore is, quite simply, who are we? Like, What are we? What's our national identity? Yeah, Australia's still got English as a national language. Still, the Queen of England is the figurehead of, of state for Australia. The Australian flag still incorporates the British flag, but then you've got some changes over time as well. Things like the national anthem changed away from God Save the Queen to Advance Australia Fair. So we've kind of got this this ongoing battle of like, are we British? Are we not British? Are we our own thing? And ultimately, as you say, look, who are we? Let's zoom. Let's get back in the old time travel rocket ship and zoom back 50,000 50, years to understand where our history begins. And this is when we were settled by the uh, ancestors of Indigenous Australians. So the first European settlers who rocked up in 1798, they had a fleet of 11 ships from Britain. They didn't say, hey, uh, that's a beautiful country to go around. They didn't get onto Google and say, that looks like a nice country, the Sydney Harbour over there. No, they said, uh, we've got an exploding population. We need to get rid of all the dirty conflicts and <laughs> convicts and just dump them away in a faraway land. That's right. They sent them as far away as they could. So those first uh, 11 ships had brought 730 convicts. The people that they didn't want in their country anymore, they'd committed some crime, maybe they stole a loaf of bread or something, uh, and they'd sent, along with those convicts, they'd sent things like guards, administrators, workers, some British naval officers uh, as the type of the, the government, and really more and more ships started flowing in, and they started just really as a dumping ground as for all the convicts. 
Of course, in your traditional historical educations, a few things missed out from 1788 onwards because uh, what happened to the indigenous population wasn't fantastic. In other colonies around the world, British colonies such as the US, Canada, India, Fiji, West Africa, British colonialists uh, dealt with the native people peacefully. They negotiated with local chiefs or princes or military. Uh, they were really, I guess, a little bit more friendly in their approach. But when they came to Australia, the uh, indigenous population, they led a nomadic lifestyle. There were no real fixed villages. Uh, nobody really owned the land, so there wasn't really anybody to negotiate with. So the British just thought, okay, well, if you don't own it, well, we're going to take it. Yeah, well, that's it. Uh, so the European settlers took the land without negotiation, no payment. There were no battles against armies um, because there were so many different tribes among, amongst the indigenous. So the European settlers came in and killed them on large scales. And this occurred for a long time. I mean, it, it's pretty wild to realize that the last large massacre of 32 indigenous was only in 1928. That doesn't seem too long ago. No. That's uh, you know, grand, grandparents' dad sort of thing. Mm. And then almost worse of all, when the British government, they heard of it, they're like, shit, what's going over in our old uh, country in Australia? They said, all right, we need to um, hang the people who are in, in control of that massacre but all the Australian population erupted and said no way and they actually supported these murderers. Because the Indigenous people were a hunter-gatherer society rather than settled farmers, some of the white Australians saw them as a more primitive population. And in fact, some of the politicians even said, uh, there is no scientific evidence that the Aborigine is a human being at all. So that's, a, that's a, obviously a very old school view to hold of another human being, uh, but that was, you know, as as early as recent as a hundred years ago. That's what some of the Australian politicians were thinking. And along this new legislation was brought in to support these uh, racist views, and Indigenous were eventually forbidden not to marry non-Indigenous without government consent. And of course, perhaps um, notoriously, the policy in the 1930s, which forcibly removed. Um, children from indigenous homes to be raised supposedly for their own good in um, parentheses there in foster homes. So in short, there was a, a white Australia policy and that white Australia policy meant no immigration from non-whites and it also applied equally to the people within their own country. So it also applied to the, the non-white indigenous people who were already on the lands. So Jared Diamond notes that he doesn't want to malign us Australians for being exceptional in our history, uh, there was a lot of racism going on around the world back then, but Australia was really the only country who was able to get together and formalise it into some sort of immigration policy. If we fast forward now a couple of years to World War One in 1914, the British, they declared war on Germany. They didn't really consult their other partners of the Commonwealth like Australia or Canada. They just said, no, we're doing this. And unhesitatingly, Australia said, okay, well, we're kind of part of Britain. We're with you guys. So we're going to send over some troops to help out. So at this stage in 1914, when Britain went to war, Australia at that time, the identity was centred around being British subjects and thought, we're just the exact same as the British. So if you guys go to war, um, we're going to go there and, and help you out because we must protect our country. And that's what mm. Australia saw Britain as, is just our country as well. Yeah, Australia sent uh, a massive uh, force of 400,000 soldiers, almost all were volunteers. And that's a big, the population was under 5 million at the time. So it was actually half of all eligible males all in that age. All volunteering, well. yeah. You know, fifty percent of the you know men of eligible age. That's a that's a big chunk. It is a big chunk, and the involvement of that su such a huge chunk in World War One, of course, is one of the most famous engagements within Australia. And there's was the ANZAC troops, the Australian New Zealand Army Corps, uh, landing on Gallipoli on April 25, 1915, and actually suffered the highest casualties due to incompetent leadership, unfortunately. Incompetent British leadership as well, yeah? Exactly. The, the Australian troops out there? Yeah, of course. It just seemed like they were sent out there with uh, not much regard for the lives who, who were sent. Yeah, to a non-Australian, the emphasis on Anzac Day, this one day that we celebrate a year is probably the really the, the biggest national holiday, I'd say, uh, nationwide that we're celebrating this one day where a massive chunk of Australian soldiers were slaughtered, uh, betrayed by British leaders halfway around the world on a peninsula that really was pretty irrelevant to Australia's national interests, but really it still seems to be a massive holiday here in Australia. 
Yeah, Jared says he learned to keep his mouth <laughs> yeah, shut. It's funny if, uh, even if you said that in Australia, like saying any hanging anything on Anzac Day, it's probably the most un-Australian thing yeah. you could possibly do. <laughs> but he makes a good point, I think. Yeah, that's right. He says that Australia's relationship towards Britain at the time was kind of one of a dutiful child seeking approval from the esteemed mother country. And this was the case for a very long time, but things started to happen after uh, interesting events of World War II. Of course, we all know the history. Japan attacked uh, the US Pearl Harbor. They attacked Britain and Australia. And Australia being quite fearful at this time of the power of Japan, they thought, oh, come on, Britain. You know, <laughs> remember, remember World War I uh, where we sent half a mil of our boys out there? Um, Britain, in return, they sent all their fleets to Singapore, which was pretty promising. But what happened next was demoralizing. Yeah, they uh, Australia was thinking, okay, we've, we've got a whole bunch of people over in Europe fighting the battles for you. We, Japan could easily come and take us, so we need a bit of help here. British sent a few ships over, but very quickly surrendered and said, okay, Japanese army, you can take us over. Here you go. We'll send a few troops over to your prisoners of war, and, and uh, we're just going to retreat back to Britain. And this absence of Brit- British ships and this really quick surrender um, gave the Japanese the ability to send their craft and bomb uh, heavily bombed Darwin, the exact same bombs or exact same uh, planes that hit Pearl Harbor were attacking Darwin, which is really Australia's only invasion. Yeah, the first of more than 60 air raids on Australia at that time. Uh, and of course, our uh, British mother country that, that we're so faithful to and so seeking of approval of didn't really give us much of a hand. And uh, Prime Minister John Curtin called, uh, said to big old Winston Churchill, he says, this is just an inexcusable betrayal. And this bitterness was hanging around for a very long time. Maybe that's why we can test the, some sporting events so much. There was a bitter, <laughs> some sort of bitterness lingering around between the countries. Um, I mean, in 1992, this is 50 years after the surrender, Paul Keating, who was famous for, I think, drinking the fastest pint in history. Nah, was it? <laughs> a different one, yeah. Different. It was Bob Hawke. Oh, Bob Hawke, yeah. okay. But he had his speech in Parliament that was still reflecting on what happened 50 years ago and cringing at the betrayal from from the British. So after World War II, there was a gradual loosening of the ties to Britain and there was this, the identity that was previously Australia was loyally British started to erode a little bit. Um, Thinking about trade, Britain had formerly been Australia's largest trading partner with 45% of all imports, but somewhat similarly paradoxically, Japan, who had been the one who was fighting Australia in World War II, actually started to become Australia's biggest trading partner and uh, in fact, overtook Britain and became Australia's most important trade ally. So being in, in Asia and being betrayed by the British, the, the identity started to be questioned and, and changed. And uh, it sort of all came to fruition in 1972 when Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, he came to power and he acted really quickly on making the changes which a lot of the country thought was inevitable and feeling that needed to happen. Yeah, he got to work pretty quick. It says here in his first 19 days... Of his, of his leadership, he did a whole bunch of things. He ended the military draft. He withdrew troops from Vietnam. He recognized the Republic of China. He announced the independence of Papua New Guinea, which was previously part of Australia. He banned visits by racistly selected overseas teams like the South African uh, cricket team during apartheid. He abolished the nomination of Australians for British uh, system like knighthoods. Uh, he reduced the voting age to 18, he increased minimum wage, he abolished university fees. That's a hell of a lot of shit in the first 19 days. But probably the biggest one was he got rid of the white Australia policy. There's a lot of stuff he got done and uh, he correctly called his reformations, hey, this has already happened. Um, even though it happened quickly in 19 days, it seems as a country, we're already there. We already landed at this point. And from there, a lot of things changed for Australia. By the time we reached 1991, Asians represented over 50% of the immigrants coming into the country. And by 2010, the percentage of Australians born overseas is actually second in the world. And right now, the, the influence of Asian immigrants is huge, and they occupy the vast majority of places in our top schools and universities. So how does Australia fit into this framework of adapting to crises and it seems like for Australia, more than the other two countries you saw, the central issue was around that core identity and the core values. Yeah, at the very beginning, it was clear that we were just a British outpost that was um, entirely loyal. But over time, the country's changed in terms of its identity, particularly for its proximity 
um, to Asia and our adapting national interests and foreign policy. And today, it, it is a question I think that pops up quite a bit in the media, maybe not as much as our ties with Britain, but particularly, say, with the, the US, which could be seen as an old uh, superpower, and we've got the rising superpower in China near us. And yeah, the ties to both, and who to side with is a is a really interesting one because our demographic is changing in one direction, but you know we might have some values like as a liberal democracy like the US. So it is a tension that does pop up within the country. Yeah, it seems like there's been uh, a lot of shifts over the last what six or seven or eight decades, uh, but I think it's the question hasn't been answered yet. I think I think it's still an, an ongoing uh, an ongoing question. Who are we? Yeah, and there's a thing, few things that are probably are inevitable, like within a decade or two, we probably will become a republic because um, so we're still part of the British Commonwealth today. So eventually we're going to make the switch, you'd imagine. You'd also say with our demographic changes, eventually we're going to have an Asian prime, prime minister. Hmm. And all these changes, you could say, hey, it might not be inc- incongruous to think that our national flag could change as well. We've currently got the Union Jack. Um, that might shift around as well. So... With these changes, it's trending in one direction. There was a there was a uh, referendum in the 1990s to say, should we ditch the Queen? Should we ditch Motherland Britain and become a republic? And it was pretty close. I think it was about what 55, 45, uh, uh, 55 saying no, we should we should stick with old Queenie. Uh, but I'd say probably not too long after she drops off, there'll probably be another one. And uh, there's a good chance that Australia will vote yes to becoming a republic. And you know who's leading? The charge of the Republic push? The Rudd man, eh? Oh, well, Rudd's one of them. And the other one who's a big part of it is um, Peter Fitzsimons. <laughs> he, he's, he's a big proponent of it. He's, he's one of the leaders of, of that big push, one of our good mates. One of our very good <laughs> mates who we uh, almost had a steak with one night. <laughs> Correct. People should check out the Instagram if they want to know the background around that. Today around the world, there's a lot of countries still practicing widespread denial of just major problems of what's going on. And remember, as in a personal crisis or a national crisis, the first step always needs to be acknowledging that you're in a crisis before you can go anywhere. You can wallow in self-pity. You can see yourself as a victim. Like Finland could have quite easily been paralyzed by self-pity by just these two big forces coming in upon them and just saying, okay, well, we're kind of screwed here. We're the victims. We'll just have to we we'll just have to cop it. Or you can sort of take a bit of that personal responsibility. You can make that decision to say, okay, I'm accepting responsibility. This is my problem. So I'm going to be the one to find the solution. And there's all sorts of ways countries can cope with uh, change. And it's really important to, to not dismiss the possibility that we can learn something from history, the case studies we've looked at, and all the other ones throughout history. Because there are a set of tools that we can use in, in the times of crises. And these include acknowledging that, that we're in a crisis, accepting responsibility, building a fence for selective change, identifying countries for help, being patient, reflecting core values, and of course, practicing honest self-appraisal. Mm-hmm.